All right. Hello, students. Welcome to another video lecture for ComSci 125 Operating Systems. In this video, we're going to look at block based concurrent uh, data structures. As you already know, in ComSci 123, we, uh, we discuss topics in different data structures like linked lists, stacks, and queues. And your implementation usually involves just a single thread. Now, there are cases when there are several threads that are trying to modify or perform operations on a data structure. So in, if we have a scenario that, like that, then uh, there should be a mechanism to perform some synchronization in order to prevent race conditions, thus uh, compromising the integrity of your data structures. In the previous chapter, we talked about blocks, the implementation of blocks as the primary abstraction so that whenever several threads are trying to execute in their critical section, uh, they need to acquire a lock first so that they can have mutual exclusion or uh, exclusive access in the critical section. And then after the critical section, the, the lock must be reached. So that is in the same way we're going to implement what we call concurrent data structures. In the literature, usually when we refer to these kinds of data structures, we refer to them as thread, uh, thread state. For example, in the case of Java, the vector class is a thread safe data structure compared to the plain uh, linked list. So the basic idea is to add locks on the critical sections of the implementation of the data structures. Now, how these locks are added will actually determine both the correctness and the performance of the data structure. So it pays, uh, it's important that we pay attention on the placement or how the locks are added in the implementation of the data structure. Let's start with the first data structure, which are basically lock, uh, counters. Right? So let's have a simple uh, implementation of a counter. As you can see in this uh, code here, we have uh, a new definition, a new type, counter underscore key. And we define four operations, in increment, decrement, and get. For the init, we simply initialize the value uh, field, okay, the value member of the structure to zero. And then the increment, we increment the value of the counter. And then decrement, we decrement that and then get we simply return the value, the value member of the structure. Now, this is a simple implementation, but this is not actually scalable if you have several threads trying to use this particular, trying to manipulate this particular counter. So a solution is to add a single lock. Okay? Uh, the lock is acquired when calling a routine that manipulates the data structure. So here are the modifications for the implementation with a single lock. So in addition to the value, we also have a lock member in the structure definition and still the same counter T. For the init, we initialize the value as usual as before, and then we initialize the lock. For the increment, we sandwich the incre uh, increment the incrementing process between the lock and unlock thread iterations. The same with the decrement and the get operations. We sandwich the 
critical sections in between lock and unlock operations. So is this correct? Right. So by adding these locks, we get a correct, somehow correct uh, implementation of counter. However, the performance of this will uh, uh, will actually suffer. It will not scale. In the reference, there is an experiment that illustrates the performance of the simple implementation, which we will refer to as precise or traditional approach. And the experiment uh, uses uh, several threads, where in each thread uh, updates a single uh, shared counter. And each thread updates the counter one million times. The experiment was performed on an iMac with four Intel 2.7 gigahertz i5 CPUs. And this is the plot that was generated for this particular experiment. The x-axis are is the number of threads and the vertical the y-axis is the time completion of the program. And as you can see in the in the plot, as you increase the number of threads, uh, just look at this uh, uh, plot here. You will notice that the time increases as the number of threads increases. So the traditional counter scales poorly because we are expecting that as we increase the number of threads, supposedly at least the number of times will still remain a constant. So we are actually interested in what we call perfect scaling. And uh, what happens is even though more work is done, it is uh, done in a parallel. And the time taken to complete the task is uh, not increased. So that's what we want. So how do we achieve that? Because as shown in this picture, using a simple or the traditional approach, it does not uh, scale well. So a solution is by, uh, approximate, by implementing an approximate counter. But this one is a precise approach because we have a single counter with a single value here. In the uh, uh, approximate counter, uh, it works by uh, representing a single logical counter via numera uh, numerous local physical counters, essentially one, count one logical counter per CPU core. And then we have a single global counter and then there are locks instead of just a single lock as shown in the implementation here wherein we only have a single lock. So how do we do that? So it, uh, we have one, uh, one, one lock for each local counter and one for the uh, global counter. So if we have uh, four CPUs or four cores, then we're going to have four local logical counters and one uh, global logical counter. And basically, we're going to have five locks here. So how does this work, this approximate counter? When a thread uh, running on a core wishes to increment the counter, it increments first its local counter. So each CPU has its own local counter, and the threads across the CPUs can update local counters without contention because they are on their own uh, CPUs. So there is actually no contention. And thus, the counter updates are scalable because they are happening in the, the local counter updates are scalable because they are happening local to each uh, CPU core. Then the local variable, uh, the local values of the counter are periodically transferred to a global counter in a, uh, in a case a thread wishes to read the value. So to be able to update the global counter, 
first the thread will acquire the global lock if it is able to acquire the global lock it will increment it by the local counters value and then the local counter is then reset to zero so whenever a global update needs to be done there will be contention of course in trying to access the single global lock but it will not happen as frequently as before now the question is how often should the local to global transfer occur right? and this value is set by a threshold as a threshold value s which is called the approximation factor the behavior is very similar to the one in our topic in scheduling wherein we have a round robin scheduling wherein we have the time quantum q if you recall our discussion on that so this here we have a specific uh, threshold s that will determine how often the transfer will happen the smaller the approximation factor the more the counter behaves like a non-scalable counter but the bigger the s the more scalable the counter is but the further of the global value might be from the actual count so here is an approximation or, or an illustration of how the approximate counter works so here we have set the threshold s to 5 and there are uh, threads on each of four cpus so we have four cpus and these are the local counters local counter for cpu for cpu uh, and then local counter for the second core etc etc so at time zero everything is set to zero and let's say at time one at time one here uh l3 or cpu3 or l3 is updated to one incremented and l4 is incremented also so take note that the global is still zero because it hasn't been updated yet because the update will happen uh, at time five so at time two we have the uh, L1 update was updated as well as L3 and L4 remains the same. At time 3, we have L1 incremented, L0 nothing's being done, and L3 is uh, incremented also. L1 stays the same and L4 uh, at, time, uh, at time 4, we have L, L1 incremented, L2 still not still untouched l3 remains the same and l4 is incremented then time 5 l1 is incremented and then l2 is one uh, uh, is incremented and l3 remains the same and l4 is incremented okay, so after that then there will be a a transfer from let's say l1 uh, there is an update Okay, so what will happen is uh, 5 will be transferred to the global, okay, so 5 from L1, and then it will be reset to 0. And then at time L4, okay, L4 will perform an update, so it will be 5, and then uh, eventually we'll have uh, 10 from uh, L4 because uh, it's been uh, incremented so that's the problem with uh, the uh, approximate counter it's not precise but there's a, a slight drift from the actual value but it is more scalable and uh, this is shown in this in this graph comparison between the traditional this is the traditional and this is the approximate counter so since each uh, thread has its own local counter so we achieve the uh, performance of 
the same for each core, even if we increase the, the number of cores or the number of threads. So we still uh, get the performance, uh, lowest performance for each core. So the importance of the threshold value is each four threads increment a counter. This is an other experiment. So each four threads uh, increment a counter one million times on uh, four on four CPUs. So low S, the performance uh, is poor. The global counter is always quite accurate, and uh, high S or approximate factor, approximation factor, uh, the performance is excellent, but the global counter. Like so, as you can see, this is the approximation uh, factor. As you increase it, the uh, time uh, is uh, decreases. Okay? So the time in seconds. But again, it scales, but the accuracy also is affected. So here's an implementation for the approximate counter. So as you can see, uh, we have the is the global value for the counter. Then we have the lock for the global counter. Then we have uh, these are the local counters. One for each CP available, and then we also have uh, L locks for local locks, which are locks for the local uh, counters. And then this is the S for the threshold. So in the init function, this is what will be done. So initialize the threshold to the threshold, and then uh, the global will be zero, initially zero, and then you initialize the lock for the global. And then this part here is basically a loop that initializes the local counters as well as it initializes the local uh, locks. For the update, okay, so usually just grab the local lock and update the local amount. Uh, once local count has risen by threshold, you grab the global lock and transfer the local variable. Date. So here is how, how it is done. So you have the pointer to the counter, then the thread ID and uh, some uh, the amount. Okay? So the assumes the amount is greater than zero, the update value. Okay. So, uh, first you obtain the lock for the for the particular uh, thread. Then you set the uh, the value, the local value, right? And then uh, if the threshold is greater than if the value of the local counter is greater than the threshold, you simply try to acquire the global lock and then transfer the transfer the local counter to the global counter then uh, release the global lock and then uh, reset the local counter to zero so basically that's how it works uh, and for the get operation still remains the same So that is for the counter, approximate counter implementation. Now let's move on to another data structure, which is called Azure, which is the concurrent uh, linked list. So you are all familiar with the linked list data structure. And here is a typical definition of a node. So we have the key and a pointer to the next element in the linked list. And then you have the list. And in this implementation, we have uh, the head node, and then we have the lock, right? And then for the init uh, list init function, we simply initialize the head to null and the uh, lock to. Also, we initialize the lock, right? simply thread uh, mutex uh, init. And for the insert, this is how it will look like. So in the same process that we, we are already familiar with, we simply sandwich the 
main operations inside or in between calls to lock and unlock as shown here. So this is the uh, list insert operation. And for the lookup for the search operation, the same process. So we simply sandwich all the operations in between a P thread uh, lock and add un unlock. So what happens is the code acquires a lock at the insert uh, routine upon entry and the code releases the lock upon exit. Now an, an interesting aspect here in the in the code for insert for example we have this line that allocates the new node however it's possible that malloc might fail because we don't have available memory or the system has no more available memory so we're going to go into this code path and we have to make sure that we unlock the lock for the list otherwise uh, others will not be able to acquire the lock once it is not released here right so that is a common problem because in certain scenarios uh, this path will not be executed so that's the problem being stated here the code releases the lock upon exit if malloc happens to fail the code must also release the lock before failing the insert for example this kind of exceptional control flow is has been shown to, to be quite error prone as i mentioned earlier so the solution is to simply lock and release only on the actual critical section in the insert code as shown here so the, in the modif modified implementation of this insert okay so this part is not placed is not treated as a critical section but this part is treated as the critical section and this critical section is sandwiched between uh, lock and unlock calls the same with the the same with the lookup list now if you're going to compare this with the implementation of the the lookup uh, here uh, so this lookup here so again you have the lock here and you have this unlock here right so in order to prevent this uh prevent having this code path right what is simply implemented is you simply have a a a break here okay that will uh exit the loop and perform this uh, same uh, unlocking instead of doing it inside the loop itself so you break and then you perform the unlock so that's how uh, this concurrent link list is implemented so how do we uh, scale uh, the link list right so we only have one lock right and the problem if we have uh, one lock is that there will be there will always be uh, contention in acquiring the lock so a solution is therefore to have multiple locks and this is called hand over hand locking or uh, lock coupling so the, the idea is to add a lock per node to the list instead of having a single lock for the entire list and when traversing the list uh, you first grab the next node's lock and then uh, release the current node's lock so it's like uh, climbing on a rope right so when you're climbing on a rope you're trying to get your hand on the next let's say uh, next fold in the rope that will be the lock for that for the next step 
and then you release the your hand from the previous uh, from the previous lock. So it's called hand over hand locking. So it enables a high degree of concurrency and least operations, but of course there will be some overheads in uh, acquiring and releasing the locks as uh, each as you traverse the. So the next one is uh, all about queues. Okay? So queues are data structures with a first in, first out policy. So in, in the reference, it talks about Michael and Scott uh, concurrent queues. Now in this Michael and Scott concurrent queues, there are actually two locks, one for the head of the queue and one for the tail. Why do we have these two locks? Uh, basically, to be able to uh, perform uh, in queue and the queue operations right, uh, at the same time. Right? So the solution here is to, if you probably recall, in com say one, two, three, you can add a add a dummy node, and this dummy node is allocated in the queue initialization code. So this approach will separate the head and tail operations and thus uh, if you have uh, one lock for the head and one lock for the tail, then you can have concurrent operations uh, for EQ and the queue. So let's look at the implementation of this queue. So we have the node again, we have the value and the pointer to the next node and this will be our queue. We have a pointer to the head and a pointer to the tail, as well as a lock for the head and a lock for the tail. For the queue init, we allocate a dummy node, this is the dummy node, and then we simply set the next uh, node to dial for that particular dummy node, and then we set the head and the tail to point to temp. Then we initialize the head lock and the tail lock. For the NQ operation, this is how it will go in, how it will look like. So first we allocate the node to be enqueued. We assert that uh, this is not this is allocated. Then we set the node's temp value to value and then the next to null for the new node short enqueuing and then we get the tail lock this is the last node basically get the tail lock uh, set the tail to next uh, set the tail next to temp and then uh, tail to temp right and then unlock for the DU operation uh, you first you acquire the uh, lock for the for the head and then you uh, get the value, or you uh, you set the temp node a temp node to the head, and then uh, you adjust the pointer, point to the next node, and then if uh, the new head is equal to null, okay, so you simply unlock because the queue uh, will be uh, empty now. And then you set the value, unlock, and then free, and you get the uh, implementation for the DQ of this uh, Michael and Scott concurrent. So the last one is the hash table. So the hash table is uh, a good data structure for key value pairs. So the implementation for concurrent hash table in our reference is to focus on a simple hash table. The hash table uh, does not resize and it is built using a uh, concurrent list. It uses a lock per hash bucket, each of which is represented by a list. So probably you've implemented a hash table in the typical implementation for a hash table is an array wherein you have the index as the, the key and then you have a hash function actually the key is passed to a hash function to generate an index 
and that index should be used in, in, as the key in the hash table. But here we have a hash table where in uh, each entry is actually a, a list, which is actually good for whenever there are collisions. So let's take a look at the implementation of this concurrent hash table. So we have buckets, the number of items, let's say uh, 101. And then we have the hash table here. Basically, it's a list, an array of, uh, of list T, which we defined earlier, right? And then when we initialize the hash table, we simply initialize each entry in the, in the list. So the hash table will be something like this. So it will be 0 to 100. Right? And this will be lists. Right? This will be concurrent lists. Right? For the insert operation or the put operation, okay. Usually for for hash tables we have uh, put and get operation. So let's say here it's called insert. So we pass the hash table, pointer to the hash table and the key. So what it simply does is to the bucket, the actual bucket will be the key mod buckets to get the index. And then we simply return the uh, the list that is present. Uh, that as on the return, uh, you insert the key on on the list, okay. and the lookup is the same. So you perform a list lookup and using the key, and then you return that to get the actual value. Okay, so that's the concurrent hash table. So you will notice that there are no locks here. The locks are actually embedded in the lists already because we're using the list underscore t or the list type as uh, entries in the uh, scenario of uh, lists actually so in terms of performance so there's also an experiment conducted by the authors so from 10,000 to 50,000 concurrent updates from each of the four threads so we have the same setup as before, right? So we have the zero here. O here represents the simple uh, concurrent list, okay? And then uh, we have the hash table. This is uh, what we have, okay? So the simple concurrent hash table scales magnificently, okay? As you increase the number of Inserts. Okay, so that will be all for this chapter.